Yeah, that's good. Well, good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my real pleasure to be here tonight. Welcome to another session of this Pulbotaf Hand Center. As you remember well, uh, last week we could enjoy a very interesting talk on the biomechanics of the forearm by Dr. Louis Shecker, our friend in, in Louisville. Tonight we will concentrate on the anatomical relationships of the distal ulna and surrounding structures, uh, how to manage the instability about the ulnar head by using the so-called four-leaf clover algorithm. As an introduction, I would say that uh, it's pertinent, uh, even though some of you already know that, but uh, it is pertinent to know that the pernal supination is not a rotation of the radius about the ulna. It's not a rotation of, of about the ulna, but about a virtual axis that connects the center of the radial head with the center of the ulna. And the consequence of that axis being oblique is that the radial head turns about itself proximally, whereas it distally, it rotates about the ulna. But this is obvious. Let's not forget that the carpus also rotates about the ulna together with the radius. So it's not the radius itself, it's a radiocarpal compound, uh, complex, the one that rotates about the ulna. Therefore, during pronounced supination, not only there is friction between the distal radius and the ulna, the DRUJ, but also between the ulnar head and the wrist, the ulnar carpal joint. In a way, I guess that I'm trying to say that this is like a hip. And yes, yeah, since in the hip, we cannot uh, differentiate the vertical from the upper surface of the, of the hip. I think that we should not, uh, we should not do it here. In other words, the distal radial joint and the ulnar carpal joints are not independent articulations, but two adjacent sectors of one single articulation. Certainly we should not that uh, call can that be called the uh, RUJ and uh, uh, ulnar carpal joints, but th that should be called radio ulnar carpal joint. And that's the way I would like to be called that. We shouldn't uh, study that joint in a vertical position either. I think that it's maximal activity. It's not when the forearm is vertical and very seldom we use the hand vertical when we use it. The ulnar head will get more than, uh, at least uh, more than 10% of all the load in that position, except that uh, if we consider it, the best is considered it horizontal. When the forearm is parallel to the floor, the ulnar head is essential pivot point about which the radiocarpal unit is resting. The radiocarpal unit is the one on one side and the uh, ulna is uh, above that. Below that, just uh, where the ray couple unit is resting on. So let, let's take this for granted during low depropion supination, particularly when the forearm is horizontal. The ulnar head is uh, really an important, a very important pivot point. And it must resist considerable forces and torques in that position. Right? So let's change our ways of thinking. And the owner cannot be uh, severed, cannot be excised without creating a problem there. This is obvious and you probably all know that. On the other hand, we need to consider that the force is compressive force in neutral position, but the, the farther away from neutral position in supination or farther away from in pronation, all the shear stress that increases compressive uh, while the compression decreases. Shear forces are higher in the extremes of rotation while compressive forces predominate in neutral position. Not only that, the surface of contact is also, depend, also depends on the amount of pronosubination so that uh, as demonstrated uh, the other day was clearly, clearly demonstrated, but that comes from from Avec and Stam, who said that the only in neutral position, only 60% of the articular portion is in contact, 
well, at the extremes of pronation and supination, less than 10% of that contact is there. So, you know, uh, from there, well, what we know is that in neutral position, that would be really a self-stable articulation. I mean, there is no need for any stabilizing agent in neutral position. We have uh, that um, convexity proximally, and we have uh, some slight concavity distally, and that's enough. Of course, in pronation and supination, we need much more because uh, we, this is going to be unstable, and therefore we need static and dynamic stabilizers. What the study, uh, static and stabilizers and dynamic stabilizers are? Well, assuming normal joint geometry, we need to know what are the structures that stop excessive bone displacements about the distal ulna. In the beginning, I remember that we only paid attention to the static stabilizers, basically ligaments. Now we know that some muscles are also effective dynamic stabilizers. They all are important. None of them is more important than the other in the forearm position. And probably this is the, the, the take home message today. We learn to appreciate the fact that the TFCC is important, of course, but when you have one instability at that level, do not think that it's only a TFCC problem. TFCC act with other structures and dynamic and static. Let's have a, a brief review of that. Of course, you all know the, the central portion of the articular disc, which is a vascular biconcave, it has a shock absorbing function, but very little stabilization effect. By contrast, there are the two radial nerve ligaments, and those are really a clear role in relation to stability. The two ligaments originate at the volar and dorsal corners of the sigmoid concavity of the radius, and they converge on the phobia where the deepest fibers insert. Remember that there are superficial fibers, continue, continue medially and distally until inserting onto the top of the ulnar styloid process. To point that some authors defend the existence of two components, the superficial and the deep. This will be the deep insertion on the phobia, and this would be the uh, ulnar styloid insertion. Uh, whether or not those are different, different structures with different functions, I would like you to see this. In this frontal section of this uh, specimen, you can see that there is no separation between the two fascicles in its radial origin. It is one ligament with two medial insertions to me. Anyway, it's not important that. In between the two insertions, there is a space filled all around the TFCC, filled with loose connective tissue with plenty of nerves and vessels. Some authors use the term ligamentum sucruentum to refer to the later. Well, I don't know if that's a ligamentum sucruentum, but really, really, this is the, the thresholds. Uh, it's the boundaries of the distal and proximal insertions of one ligament. The onocarpal ligaments are also important for the sagittal stability of the medial column of the wrist. As you know, they originate on the anterior border of the triangle fibro cartilage and consist of two diverging bursal bundles, the onotrochytral bundle and the onologate bundle. There's some, some uh, specimens you can find that superficial extension to the distal row, the onocapitate bundle. When these ligaments are torn, the medial column of the wrist moves palmarly and that's the cause of rotation, subluxation, and supination that's so typical, it's so typical in rheumatoid patients. So whenever we see that, do not jump into the conclusion that this is an ulnar dislocation, because radial ulna, particularly in rheumatoid patients, the radius and ulna are okay. It's that uh, falling of the ulna column into a forward position, that looks like there is a dislocation there, but it's not really dislocation. It's really carpal supination deformity because of the ulnar carpal ligaments being torn. 
The distal fibers of the brain ulnar interosseous membrane are also considered secondary static stabilizers as well. They are important in cases where there is complete evolution of the distal ulnar ligaments associated with a distal fracture of the carpus. In those circumstances, the instability cannot be denied. But when the fracture has been reduced, if that uh, it's been anatomically reduced, as in this case, the wrist becomes stable again. The ligament remains evolved, but the joint is stable. How is that? Well, the only explanation for that would be produced by these distal fibers of the interosseous membrane. Well, what's the role of the different muscles involved in these joints? Let's start by the brachialis, the brachialis muscle. The brachialis muscle, as you know, is the first muscle to react against an external force being transferred by the radius into the arm. You have uh, that compression, it's an external force, expand on the distal radius, and the radius migrates proximally and uh, the brachialis muscle is that generating the reaction force necessary to achieve a sound equilibrium. What's the consequence of that? Well, there's a co-optation, approximation of the distal radial joint articulations in neutral prosopination. And because of that, we can consider the brachialis muscle as one dynamic, if you will, stabilizer of the DRUJ in neutral prosopination. There are two more that may be difficult to understand, but, but they are really indeed contribute to stability. Are the muscles APL and EPV? As you know, those are the muscles that have uh, that go across the first compartment. Why they are called uh, stabilizers? Well, because in, a fact, in fact, they originate in the ulna, but have that oblique way towards the first sensor compartment that therefore any contraction of those muscles will compress the DRUJ. But that compression may be enough as to maintain the joint stable, the joint reduced. What about the XU, the extensor capillaries? This has been more extendedly uh, studied and analyzed in many papers. Let, let's see what, what's going on in there. As you know, the membrane that keeps the issue tendon in its, you know, it, in its own compartment, the cyst compartment, has been uh, regarded as a very important secondary stabilizer in the region. The tendon is strongly attached to the ulna, and the two of them rotate together, regardless of the rest of the extensors tendon do. In that case, we have uh, made fun of this, uh, saying, well, this is a a couple dancing all together because, well, it doesn't matter at the level of the ulnar head that she is strongly attached to the ulna and yet it's independent of the sensor retinacle. You can see in the preparation to the left, the fact that the tendon is in its sheath and to the right in a position, the sensor retinacle can be separated from the essential retinaculum subsheet. At the more distal level, the ulnar styloid that in the, uh, at the level of the ulnar styloid, that sheath becomes thinner and almost disappears as a separated entity. From that point on, the issue becomes protected by the extensor retinaculum, which forces the tendon to move following the radius. Obviously, there is a zone between the tendon where the tendon suddenly changes in both direction and rotation during pronosupination. It's a crucial that, uh, point because that represents a torsion occurring distal to the ulnar styloid. If that torsion occurs proximal to that joint, the tendon will subluxe from its compartment, a problem which consequences are very well known. The moment arm of the tendon will increase and the bridge will become a steer and inflection and non deviation. The tendon of the issue is constrained in a fairly narrow compartment at the dorsal aspect of the ulnar head. 
And therefore, impregnation leaves the tendon is located in the medial edge of the ulna. As a result, the contraction of this muscle triggers the dynamic compression of the ulnar head against the sigmoid cavity of the radius. So the mechanism of the issue is uh, depends on how you look. It depends, it's a dynamic one. It has um, an effect uh, in pronation. In pronation, the pronator quadratus muscle is distended. And the pronator quadratus muscle is also an important stabilizer of the joint. In pronation, as we've seen, the muscle is distended, while in supination, it's in tension. And the tension and embraces the ulnar head around its medial fibers. The action of this muscle is therefore more effective in supination because in this position, the muscle produces a joint cooptation that prevents instability. This is a case to show how much the muscle can be a stabilizer. This is, by the way, it's not a patient. It's somebody who showed me that instability and his ability by just contracting specific muscles, its ability to control that motion. So with this in mind, let's, let's go back to that case presentation. It's a case presentation of, a, of one instability of the DRUJ that uh, we saw some time ago. It was a male chemist, 25 years old, that in September 2009 suffered hyperpronation. And he attended some time after attending our clinic and we were looking at this. And we found that displaceability that you see was wrist pain and the radio ulnar carpal joint was unstable. To the right, you can see that that MRI scan in 2009 was not great, but at least it helped us to understand that there was really a void, something in abulsion, type 1B, uh, according to Palmer classification, of the periphery of that, that the FCC. It was a time that I was, uh, well, as anybody else, I was very keen on arthroscopy. And uh, I said, well, let's, let's uh, reinsert the capsule of this arthroscopically because it's a type 1B and I thought that was enough. So we did that and look at what happened five months post up. In March, 2010, he had a displaced the distal radius palmally and the only one was protruding dorsal. The three lines that you see here, the, the, the yellow, the red, and the blue, are just to, to say something that it's uh, somehow important. In a, if the wrist was profiled radiologically properly, the red one, the red of line that it is, the pisiform, should not be in between the outline of the capitate in yellow and the one in blue for the escape for To know, in other words, to know if this is a pure lateral view, you should always check on that. And by checking that, we realize that this was a true lateral view. And the fact of having that uh, displacement of the radius relative to the owner here, that was the problem problem that uh, I resolve by saying, okay, that means that, well, I'm sorry, but we should now go Palmer because there was a lack of supination and we should go Palmer because probably there was something uh, bad over there. So we approach it Palmer and you can see the owner with that, uh, that big junk of cartilage uh, left here and the TFC was uh, completely avulsed again. So we placed one of those uh, anchor sutures at the time we were using that. That was a volar approach. And again, we failed to, well, not that we failed, but it was a disaster, complete disaster. I mean, that I was very worried about because seven months post-op, the second operation, it was even worse than before. It was one of those cases that uh, you are kind, kind of depressed almost to commit suicide because we had not seen all the, all the case properly. If you look at this, you'll realize that there's something else about that. If you see that the, that the evolution here, 
we should have realized that the issue was not in its shield. The issue was a blot, the issue. And we should have uh, learned also that there was some fluid inside of the volar surface. So, you know, we had seen the tree, but not the forest. And that's the message, yeah, the second message today is that we should not uh, get uh, a decision of a therapeutic decision without looking at everything. If you look at the uh, tree, if you see a tree, you should look around because that, that, that tells you a lot of things. There would have been a TFCC derangement of cord, but also subluxation, stable issue, maybe some muscle imbalance. What about bone deformities? What about the castle incarcerations? I mean, we should have checked on everything. And then, of course, the question is, why shouldn't we follow an algorithm that helps us not to miss the forest when we see a tree? That was the base upon, and then here you have uh, my friend Sanjeev Kakar from, from the main clinic. He helped me a lot on this, on putting together this paper. Uh, it's a paper that basically what it says is, we need to find a way that uh, simplifies uh, the, the treatment process by providing you a way of uh, not missing that, that, that situation. That was a paper that we published in 2016. It's called the four leaf clover treatment algorithm of this, four leaf clover algorithm. It's nothing but actually it's a Venn's diagram. It's, you know, uh, it's a graphical representation of the relations between factors, blah, blah, blah. You all know what the, what the Venn's diagram means. It's uh, made of circles, one, uh, some of them interceding with the, each other. And that means that um, you, uh, in this case, you should uh, think of uh, the four most important factors. One would be deformity of the articulating bones. The second one would be the brittle or cartilage damage. The third would be the FCC degeneration. And the fourth would be subluxability or dislocability of the issue tendon. Of course, uh, those are mutually exclusive factors. That, what does it mean? Well, it means that uh, you may have uh, the RUJ with the muscle tendon dislocated or not. You may have a bone deformity with a cartilage defect or not. You may have a soft tissue defect and a bone deformity as well. So all of those combined give up with uh, 15, 15 different types of the RUJ instability. There must be 15 at least. Of course, if there are 15, uh, you cannot expect a resident uh, to be tonight. Uh, knowing all of them one after the other. So what the algorithm is solving is that, how to use this algorithm? Yeah, the, the diagram is uh, as simple as a checklist. Uh, you know to, uh, that you take the, the airplane and you have a checklist, uh, all the things that you need to consider, you need to currency, you need uh, many things, and you just put a check on in that list, no? The same here, you see this as if it was a simple checklist. You should go through all aspects of the problem and place a check mark in every circle where the anomaly is detected. Third, you should ask yourself, how would you treat that anomaly? If that, the, if it was the, the only problem with that patient, I mean, uh, separate it. And finally, evaluate if it's possible and feasible and sometimes desirable, treating all problems in the same session. Based on that, let's see how it works. So uh, you have uh, four questions. Is there a bone deformity? Is there a TFCC injury? Is there yes or no? And you apply that yes or no. And if there is only a bone deformity, of course, it's very easy because you only need to correct with the corrective osteotomy, you correct that deformity, you correct that malunion that was established and everything comes back to normal. If you have a, a cartilage defect, 
but the breast is okay, but just uh, performing a partial arthroplasty or a resection arthroplasty or an implant arthroplasty, you are certain that you are solving the problem. But again, you need to have everything else normal. The third, uh, if you have a repairable TFCC tear and everything else is normal, of course, that is easy because by just repairing that, that would have been okay. The problem, if it's non-repairable, well, no, not a problem. I'm, I mean, if it's non-repairable, but the, there are no cartilage effect, no bone deformity, then it's easy because you can do a reconstruction of ligaments using a tendon or whatever the technique you like the most. And yet uh, you may have as an isolated thing, an unstable issue tendon. If the tendon is you, the extensor capillaries is uh, subluxable and the rest is normal. Well, you have many options, but one of the option is to do a sheath reconstruction that you can do it the way you like. This is the way we like it. Uh, the tendon is here. We elevate the capsule and we place it in a uh, intracapsular position, uh, making sure that you have that gliding effect uh, solved by early, early rehabilitation. What about if there are two problems? If you have a combination of two problems, you need to combine two treatments. The nice thing of this articulation is that most treatments allow you to do them at the same time as the other. I mean, you may have a uh, corrective osteotomy and a DRUJ arthroplasty, easy. You may correct the osteotomy and do a ligament reconstruction if that's required. An easy stabilization and DRUJ arthroplasty is possible to do. So by doing this, we can have all those options. You have bone deformity, and cartilage defect, yes, the breast is normal, okay. In those cases, we can produce a cor a corrective osteotomy, and also we can use an implant like in this case. If you have a non-repairable TFCC and you have an unstable issue tendon, of course, you can do both. You can do a tenoplasty, a ligamentoplasty with tendon here, and taking into this uh, in during the, the operation, you can do the same as you would do if that uh, tendon subluxation was unstable. If you have bone deformity, you have uh, a non-repairable TFCC. I mean, uh, this is exactly the same. You have the and the corrective osteotomy, the LUJ ligament reconstruction. And if you have a joint defect and you have a uh, and you have an unstable issue, of course, you may use that and you may recreate that the, the, the issue reconstruction on the dorsum of the ulna. So is it possible? Yes. Is wishful thinking more most of the times? There's a wishful thinking option here, but I must assure you that if you do, if you have that, if you have that uh, holistic approach to the case, in which uh, you appreciate that there are two uh, possible problems, you should apply at least to try the two uh, treatment. Uh, what about if you have a combination of three, four? If you have a combination of three, four factors, you must combine the three or four treatments, of course, it's not always easy. And usually it may be as, uh, cases that come to you that are so complicated that there is no way um, to do that in those cases. Salvage procedure is the answer. So let's go back to the case resolution. What did we do with that case? Well, the case was really, uh, I was really sorry about that because uh, it was obvious at that time that it was um, something that we had looked into carefully. There was a cartilage defect, there was a TFCC injury, and there was an, an ECU tendon uh, instability. Well, we applied the, the four leaf clover algorithm, and we realized that we had to do a hemiarthroplasty, a TFCC repair, and relocation of that tendon on the dorsum of the, the cisco uh, compartment. 
everything could be done in one single uh, thing. And uh, we, uh, for arthroplastic, we did the match on the procedure. Let's, see, let's remember that this was in 2009, and that was at the time one of the options probably. And uh, now we would have done something different, maybe an arthroplasty, uh, an implant arthroplasty, but that worked very well. Resection of the plastic majorna is a, is a resection of the plastic that it's not the, the, it's not like a, a complete resection. This is something that can be done. And the way we do it is by just creating a distal shape. We shape the distal ulna as in a pencil, by producing a very parallel uh, surfaces between the, the ulna and the radius. Uh, this is a sharp pencil type of... Uh, of resection. And then with the rongeur, we just make these uh, rounded uh, corners. And then we use some sort of uh, remnant of the TFCC if it's available. If not, we usually use uh, the ulnar carpal ligaments. And we reattach those to the tip of that ulnar stump. And because it's, uh, because it's rounded, that allows us to provide the a little bit of a stability distal and to allow to go back to some uh, gliding around the distal end of the ulna. We relocate the issue tendon in the dorsal sulcus of the ulnar head. And that's uh, it, um, that, uh, how it looked like in 2013. That was already four years almost after that. And uh, in the end, we, we we end up being good friends with him and he's doing very well. And even now, as you can see, he's got a very, very acceptable result. I wouldn't say that it was perfect, but I also, I wouldn't say that uh, if I had known from the beginning, what was the real issue, if I had had that, uh, that algorithm available, or I had been aware myself about the three problems that were hidden in the gate, probably the result would have not been much better. Well, in the end, what I'm trying to say is that the four-leaf clover algorithm is not magic. It's just uh, a way of saying you should look uh, locally, but not to miss globally the case. It's okay if uh, we are keen on uh, ligament reconstruction one way or, not, or another, but do not, uh, do not jump into a conclusion too early. Try to look around and not to miss everything else uh, of your exploration or your examination. Thank you very much, guys. I, I think that uh, is, it's a simple, a simple topic, but I think it's one of the most important ones because um, it's too, too frequently we follow into that problem that we think that we have the answer by just looking at the x-rays. And we should look at the x-rays, but also we should look at the, uh, the x-rays. We should examine clinical examination. And then even with that, we should look at things that usually we don't. Thank you very much. Uh, that's enough for today.